Uh, how's it going? We're, we are so early. Uh, usually we're a little late, but we're a full day early now. I know, we're on our new night. Monday nights here in the Frontline Gaming Network. Welcome to Grim After Dark, the Frontline Gaming Network's weekly interview show uh, where we hit the high points of the last week in the Warhammer community and talk to the best players and content creators from all around the world about the one thing we all love, Warhammer. Uh, we also drop our keyboards to the ground uh, in a horrible, crashy noise. But that's fine. We'll fix it in post. Because tonight we welcome Tyler Bortel, a man who not only took his turn as to a 5-1 finish at the SoCal Open, uh, pre Octarius, obviously, here, uh, but he's the first guest we've had on who can make himself sound better after his appearance because he's also the editor of the show. My co-host tonight needs some introduction. Uh, he's the terror of the mid-tables, and he's pre bandwagging Tyranids like it's 2017, and uh, it's Danny McDivitt. Hey, I'll have you know that I've been pre bandwagoning Tyranids for literally years, on and off. You were yeah, like, since 2017. Actually, everything you said is correct. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, you're trying to defend yourself, and I appreciate that. Um, I just have this page of facts here. Um, Danny, uh, after the shocking conclusion to the SoCal Open, uh, many have asked, nay, demanded that orcs be nerfed into the ground. Um, however, uh, here we see a completely unbiased poll uh, I believe it's from the Seth the Mad Doc YouTube channel. Whoever uh, that showing is. The, the, the most players don't actually believe that a list that can completely table an internationally renowned Warhammer player in a single turn is broken. Um, Danny, is this list broken? Uh, and kind of what needs to be done to curb it? Sorry, I just I was uh, looking at my, new, my orc models that I just bought. Uh, no, no, it's <laughs> totally not broken. It's fine. Everyone Please don't could, consider uh, it broken until I've assembled and painted <laughs> at least one GT. <laughs> exactly exactly uh but seriously yeah like it's not in a good place uh like there's some arm like there are probably what like four armies now that need like a good solid like just kick in the jewels yeah. and uh we'll see we'll see what happens um but uh yeah uh hopefully the game balance will be restored yeah and then the follow-up says why are you such a corporate shill about it I mean, I don't know who put that there. That's just a bizarre thing. It's, it's a party line. Even. Oh, wait, no, no. It's <laughs> it's in the style guide, right, John? We talked about it. Is, it is. It is. Um, yeah, no, no negativity ever. That's, you know, that's what my chain says. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. In jokes uh, and poor jokes aside, uh, back to more poor jokes. Yep. Uh, and this has literally nothing to do with recent news. Uh, it's not timely or biting commentary. Uh, it mm -hmm. was just a great picture that was sent to me uh, that shows the Spanish translation of Necron Overlord is Senor Supremo. Hell yeah. Um, that's it. That, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I really am hopeful to turn this into a bizarre translation bit where people can send us what uh, models and units are called in different languages. I would love that. Uh, do I have literally any follow-up to this? No, other than the fact that a Necron Overlord in Spanish sounds like a Taco Bell menu item. Uh, Danny, thoughts? Don't dispute his power, John. He is Senor <laughs> Supremo, and you will bow to him. <laughs> I will say, so I did like a little research on this as well, where I actually Googled what Overlord what did you wait? to Spanish. <laughs> okay, no, Please. no, yeah, tell me about your Continue. Google search, John. No. Yeah, no, so, it's so great. I, I Google I Googled what uh like using Google Translate it went from like English to Spanish and I just put overlord in. Uh and it just came back as senor, uh, which means that you know when you're being polite to, to Spanish people, you're not saying Mr. You're saying overlord. Uh yeah. which is why everyone's so friendly back to you, because you're like, whoa, that that's a lot going in there. Uh but yeah, pretty much. Uh, send me your bizarre Warhammer translations. Uh, I really want to see kind of the bizarre things that are put out there. Um, and what things are called, and not just uh, aspiring senior supremos. <laughs> it's a double, double layer Perfect. joke. Yeah, that was a, that was a twofer, John. You did it. It was a, it was a twofer. Uh, neither were funny. <laughs> neither were funny, but but we got them out there. We got the uh, back in other news here, and more modern news. The single hardest working man in wargaming. Uh, that would be the head of the Warhammer licensing department. Uh, is that it again? Uh, with this range of fully licensed scented candles. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah. now, now you too can fill your room with the smell of the Astro Militarum, the smoky secrecy <laughs> of the Dark Angels, or Paul Winters. Um, you would expect us to make jokes about what the smells are like, um, but we here at Grim After Dark are of a higher quality than that. And we want you to use this as an opportunity to let everyone here be the first to experience these. Uh, this is the officially licensed Frontline Gaming Network candle. 
Uh, it's of the highest quality. However, sometimes the smell is not in sync with the candle. The quality de uh, varies depending on the day you use it. Um, while you really like it, you kind of wish it was five separate candles than one one continuously random nasal feed. It smells like LVO. <laughs> yeah. What happens is for this candle, you light it, then seven hours later, the candle. Yes, yeah, seven out. hours later, you <laughs> so, get the next smell. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> See, guy calls shills after that. Holy cow. Anyway, <laughs> finally. <laughs> finally, and then you, you thank you, Airborne. It smells like cabbage and broken dreams. Um, that That is the, the Paul Winters candle. Um, so I was going to say, the Astro Militarum one probably smells like trench foot. And uh, you know you want your house smelling like that. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> smells like war. So, yeah. <laughs> moving on. Uh we had this wonderful uh, post here from a random 40k group. I'm a member of so many 40k groups, but okay. The boycott of GW is having an effect. Their stocks drop 7.7%. <laughs> if this keeps up, they will have to stop ignoring their customers. And I want to point out here that um, the usually should just be three ellipses afterwards. And they've gone to use four, uh, which makes me want to disregard their point entirely. Well, anyway. It could be Sorry. four if they were if they were admitting the end of a sentence and then they wanted to end the sentence. That that's fair. That's fair. But they didn't. They're just. <laughs> I don't think that's right. what they were trying to do. I think they're just. I, I don't it. think so. Please, uh, the whoever posted this, I, I put the name up. But if you could send me your literally intent uh, for how this is written, I would really appreciate that. Um, however. There was over <laughs> seven hundred responses to this post, and there was a lot of really uh, kind of uh, passion that went around it. Um, however, for more of this, we go to our very own Val Heffelfinger uh, to kind of give us some financial advice on GW here. <laughs> uh, he's currently I'm, unavailable. I'm being, I'm being told by my producer that, aside from having four days' worth of notice, I'm being specifically told um, beforehand <laughs> that he does not have the ability to do that there. Um, but he does say uh, it's what, what is it they usually say, Danny? Uh, causality is not causation. Yeah, that's the same, John. You got it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> that works. Um, finally tonight. But it's fine. We'll fix it in post. Yeah, it's, perfect. It's, it's great. It's great. <laughs> I hope off screen someone's keeping a list of all this. Uh, yeah. There we go. Can they hear me? Correlation Can the stream hear me? Causation. There we the go. The stream might I, be able to I'm hear me. I'm talking now. Stuff, obviously. Uh, but hey, custodians are coming. Gene Sealer Cult's coming. Uh, Shadow yep. Throne is the latest battle bog set on the throne world itself uh, with three characters and ten little upset tradesmen against the might of the Emperor's Custodes. Uh, Danny, is this the most unbalanced battle box ever? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but guess what? That, sab that saboteur is like hot fire and the custodian uh, champion guy is... Has like some of the coolest written rules. Like I'm super excited about this box. I think it's going to be great for the game. I'm excited about it. I'm less excited about Genius Oak Cult players to get their one fancy character. You probably want to have three of. You have to get three HQs that you can't really duplicate. Um, and your custodian, uh, you're going to be sit with like, wow, well, that's a better half of the box. But still, it's kind of a bizarre choice uh, of battle box. John, the global supply chain is in shambles. <laughs> And we need to support Games Workshop any possible way we can. So if you're not buying three boxes of this, you're basically a traitor to the game and you should probably just quit. Yeah. I mean, this really goes against uh, their stock price falling 7.7%. But the, yeah. the way to, to reverse that is just for like one set of battle boxes. If it wasn't for this, it was going to be Tyranids oh. versus. Uh, yeah, sorry. You just suggest a one sided battle box? <laughs> <laughs> or you know, combat patrol, whatever you want yeah, to call yeah, it. Sure. Which, whatever find, you want to call it, yeah. I find like one side of battle box is way more eloquent uh, way of kind sure. of putting it. Ooh. I can see the tagline: <laughs> "Play with yourself." <laughs> <laughs> oh, and if there isn't some Christmas bundles on the FLG website uh, that are just play with yourself deals, then what are we even doing here, Danny? <laughs> I don't know, John. <laughs> but what even are we doing here danny uh, uh i'm not super funny uh so why don't we take us past this awfulness 
uh, and kind of take us on to our our guest for the evening. No, man, we're having a good time. But no, yeah, let's introduce the let's introduce the guest. Uh, so you may know him um, as the Tyranid Wrangler. Um, he once wore an extremely fancy hat, although I think he's ditched the hat. Uh, he shaved off his beard for charity, um, uh, looking like the the smooth faced baby that he actually is. Uh, tonight, we're proud to welcome Tyler Bortel onto the show. Howdy, howdy, y'all. Pleasure to be here. And I will say, I coined when he shaved his beard that he looked like the bad guy from an Indiana Jones movie. More, more <laughs> was it the mustache? <laughs> no, no, it was just the, the straight, oh. the face. It's okay. those proud Germanic features. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. <laughs> I am very Jewish. That's <laughs> not a bad thing. Holy cow. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> very Jewish Tyler Botel. Tyler, uh, you were recently at SoCal. Let's try and save this a little bit here moving on. Uh, we'll fix Please. it in post. But um, <laughs> oh. you were recently at SoCal uh, with Tyranids. Um, Forces pre- any kind well, of yeah, let's, let's Forces get it right. Okay. Well, I guess for laymen like me, people who don't know anything, what is the difference between Forces of the Hive Mind and the Tyranid? Yeah, so forces of the hive mind is one of the made up words that the uh, aristocracy and the oligarchy behind um, the ITC uh, sort of shuffled around their little ponds uh, to make us play different things. Um, It's not a real thing, but um, yeah. Uh, So uh, good old old Patriarch Riccio went in and said, okay, if you're playing Tyranids and Gene Sealer Cult at the same time, we'll give it a new name. So we call that forces of the hive mind. Yeah. but uh, it just means you got both at the same time, even though there is no such keyword. Couldn't Sorry, this also include a... Sorry, go okay. Could this also include a Brood Brothers detachment, or how do they fall into that? That's a great question. If you're playing just GSC plus Brood Brothers... <laughs> what even are you? I mean, you're... Well, you're off your rocker is what you are. But uh, <laughs> if, uh, if you did make that decision, I think you still might qualify as, as, a, as mono GSC. But okay. like, no one questions your faction submissions anyway. Right. Um, so, I mean, as I fair. know from personal experience, uh, based on many instances of players in my meta cheating and bringing whatever they wanted and then claiming Look, another. It was three times, and I said sorry one of them, and you <laughs> need to get over it. It was like I won't. two years you can't ago. can't make me. I'm still mad about it. You still beat yeah, me. If- if you need any more evidence, go look at the, the best in faction current rankings for Adeptus Sororitas. I don't think half those players played any kind of sisters. <laughs> Beautiful. Right. Top of the list automatic. Anyway. John, I told you, you can't just, you can't say you're playing assassins if you bring one assassin in your list. That's not how that works. There was a part of me a long time ago that wanted to go to LVO 1900 uh-huh. points down, just running a single assassin. So I would win best in faction. <laughs> And I thought, while insanely clever, one, I'm going to give someone six very boring or six people very boring games where they're going to look and be like, well, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, And then then two, um, that's a lot of money to spend to go to somewhere (laughs) to be shot off the table in less time than an orc shooting phase. I mean, John, Um, day one is going to take you at least 15 hours. So, like, just be aware of that. (laughs) That's right. No, I was just writing down in the old style guide here. Um, Reese in a 16th century court attire, uh, which is what I got from you saying. <laughs> the FLG oligarchy. Yeah, oligarchy was just kind of the big frilly, like Black Hatter the second uh, for some of our English listeners. Sure. Um, but you've been playing Tyranids for like a long time. So like forever, as long as I've been talking to you anyway, it's always been the Tyler the Tyranid Wrangler kind of things like that. What drew you towards uh, Tyranids as a faction to play? Yeah, I um when I got back in when I when I got into the game initially, I was actually a Tau player, um because uh you we know, have very casual like cool robots and whatnot, oh, um God. and then as soon as I tried to start playing somewhat seriously, I realized how miserable it was and why everybody so hated me. To turn it? Yeah, um, <laughs> I also really I at the time I really I wanted some close combat and a buddy of mine was uh, was getting out of the hobby had a lot of of horrific tyranids that he must have painted when he was no more than 14 years old um but uh he let him and go you for being a 15 year old at the time looked down upon <laughs> exactly um like that that's very funny but i, I was 15 um, 
Denny, we keep making these jokes that are way too close to the line or over the line of accuracy there. <laughs> Yeah, but so I, I switched. I switched over to bugs, and this was like, um, uh, this was like in late late seventh edition, I guess. No, late sixth, somewhere somewhere in seventh edition, I think. I switched over to bugs, and then the new GSC stuff came out in seventh, and I got real excited about it, um, and took that with me as I moved into into eighth edition. Um, the the fun fact, if you're trying to date just how how young I am in this community, um, eighth edition came out two months after I graduated high school. Oh yeah, Danny, dude. Oh, so why do we keep inviting these people? I don't know. You just man. make us feel like <laughs> old as shit. Just makes me feel old. Yeah, for real. <sighs> Fine, cool. Um, yeah, cool. Go. So, go, go ahead. Yo, go, Danny. No, I'm still oh. disgusted by his age. So, tell us, like, what drew you to Tyranid specifically? Like, you said that you said that you wanted some melee. Were there any other reasons like aesthetics or was there a particular model you enjoyed? Yeah, I can, I can appreciate a lot of the aesthetics. I also just generally like things that have like more than zero letters in common with my first name. Um, but uh, I think that um, I think the things that the things that certainly get me excited about bugs these days is at least are mostly in the shenanigans and the jank. Um, sure. I generally sort of refuse to play math lists. Um, and that's just not an option for Tyranids anyway, so why bother? Um, so that's been a lot of fun. Uh, so I guess maybe I, just to kind of jump in there, like for yeah. maybe some of our listeners or viewers who might not know what this is, what is a math mm -hmm. list? Yeah, a math list is, um, I mean, there's none of those in the game right now, so I could understand <laughs> why they might be sort of sort of new. But there's this, um, this sort of indie orc build that's going around in the Freebooters faction, uh, where you table your opponent in two turns. Um, that's a math list. Wait, you uh, take two turns to do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just roll sixes, John. It'll be fine. Um, so sort of like any, a any... list where you just drown people in dice and mathematically there's nothing you can do, right? Yeah, exactly. If your win condition is tabling your opponent, your list is fundamentally not interesting to me. Um, so by all means, win tournaments with that. But like, there's theoretically a cap on that. There really should be. When there isn't, it's a, not a great sign for the state of the game. But uh, I'm, I'm just not interested in, in tabling people that quickly. I, too, I'm not interested in tabling people quickly. And that's why I don't do that. And it has nothing at all to do with uh, player skill or army construction <laughs> skill or, or things along those lines there. Uh, it's entirely because I am not into the math. Like, at all. So what were your, kind of your first few experiences with Tyranids? Because there's like, there's like coming out, like when you came out of high school, like 2021, when you first started playing Tyranids, <laughs> um, there's like there are a few different builds that you were, could, could have run Tyranid wise there. Um, what was some of the ones that really kind of drew your eye? Were you like a monster mash person? Or were you like kind of like a meat cart, uh, meat curtain or meat, cur meat carpet kind of person? Yeah, I, <laughs> That's another kind of person. Feel free to answer that one too, though. Yeah, um, I, uh, I I am a big fan of the, the meat curtains. The old um, meat curtain. Yeah. yeah, I definitely really like like the horde. Um, I uh, early er, earlier in eighth, uh, I was playing a lot of the more sort of Alex McDougal style <laughs> crack and gene stealers and eventually uh -huh. aberrants on top of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, in later eighth edition, I really got sort of in my, I grind with, with a gaunt carpet with 180 termagants with 60 acolytes. Um, I later swapped acolytes out for gaunt carpet plus oh, aberrants you're, you're was meaning, a lot of fun. Sorry. So you're meaning a gaunt curtain, right? Yes. You're a gaunt carpet. carpet. Yes, I feel you're meaning to stick through. Okay. Perfect. A curtain of, a curtain of, uh, of, uh, of exoskeletal meat just sort of yeah. coating the table table and uh that was a lot of fun i love the horde um that's that that is by the way like at uh, the next round of gw uh, candles is going to be carpet or curtain of exoskeletal meat <laughs> kite and carpet carpet we got or curtain we got it mm -hmm. yeah. carpet yeah yeah Perfect. Anyway, please continue without me interrupting with Kendall. But yeah, so I, I I really enjoyed the uh the hordes. Uh, they were great. Ninth edition comes around and hordes are just they're not what they used to be. Um, certainly not the the Tyranid version of them. So I moved over from Termagants over to Ripper Swarms. I was playing like fifty four Rippers and Sporocysts and Biovores and wacky stuff like that for a while. Um, and I mean it was bad. None of it was good. 
there wasn't uh, there weren't a lot of competitive builds to go around until we got Forge World, and now we've sort of been inching our way back up, right up until uh, you know where things get interesting. But I'm sure we'll get to that later. Ooh, yeah. like look at that little tease move, moving on there. So very bold of you to assume the the nature of our questioning is going <laughs> to go to Octarius immediately, <laughs> or be interesting. So I guess yeah. kind of moving through this, so we can get to what you actually want to talk about as you lead us mm -hmm. on and tell us what to ask you. Um, Tyranids and Ninth Edition so far um, have been kind of like a hit and miss. And kind of like one of the reasons we pulled you on here to talk is because, like I said, uh, a five-one performance at SoCal was seen to be kind of um, surprising to a lot because of the, the the way that kind of the the gts and majors have been finishing recently and the fact that you did it with kind of a, a forces of the hive mind bent so so what is it that tyranids struggle with this edition so hard well we struggle with well we struggle first of all we struggle with being an eighth edition codex which has its biggest problem and we don't have any faction secondaries so you're immediately basically just playing 15 points down once you're fighting against someone who like knew what they were doing and picked up the correct codex um but additionally, we have no real reliable way to hold primary. Like a lot of the choices in my list are really weird, but they're just designed around being able to hold an objective in the open, which is not a thing that Tyranids can do functionally. We have no durability. Um, our units are all radically overcosted, so we can't do a lot of damage output. Uh, and bugs as a super faction, forces especially, back in 8th, were relying on massive amounts of CP. I would start a game with 21 command points and burn through all of them in two turns. Um, and not having access to any of that anymore has just like really hampered down on what we're able to actually accomplish. Mathematically, you can tell you burn through it in one turn now because you only get maximum 12. Yeah, there we go. That's some quick maths. Mm -hmm. um, so what are, what are some of the lists you kind of come up with? What are some secondaries that you're choosing? Uh, because like I say, you don't have access to these uh, faction-specific secondaries that are kind of really auto-takes for a lot of these lists. What are you kind of taking as a tournament player? Yeah, so my my list in its SoCal orientation was basically made to, without looking at my opponent's army, take Stranglehold, Rod, and to the last, and just not even think about it. Obviously, there's going to be situations where there's a mission secondary, or uh, an opponent's going to give something up easily where you can swap out to the last, or maybe to the last just isn't really an option. But Stranglehold and Rod just mm -hmm. fully required, um, and I maintain that Stranglehold is better than Engage on All Fronts on at least eight of the nine missions. Why is that? Because I know Engage No Fronts, like a lot of players, like it's almost like an auto take. And like I know maybe some of the wording that you don't necessarily have to hold anything, um, that you kind of just have to be like present in those table quarters. And it's kind mm -hmm. of conceived to be easier for that. What makes Stranglehold a better choice than Engage? Yeah, en Engage is easier if your goal is to score 15 points on your secondary. Um, my goal is actually to win the game, though. Uh, oh. And in that, that sense, I'm already doing things that a stranglehold is accomplishing. If my opponent is holding three objectives at the end of my turn, I've probably already lost the game. So why not get score points for not letting them do that? Yeah. And then I just need to grab a single objective instead of forcing myself into two extra quadrants. It's, um, it's just what I want to be doing already instead of an additional thing to think about. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. that's why I love Stranglehold so much. Danny, kind of, what's, what's your take on that? Because that's an issue, because I said Engage seems to be like a, a standard uh, objective for a lot of people to kind of take here. So what's your kind of take? Because I know you've talked positively about Stranglehold before. Yeah, I very rarely take uh, Engage because, first of all, it's it's not it's not necessarily easy to get into a table quarter with an entire unit. Like, there's that caveat as well that's kind of difficult to achieve. And again, you're already playing for the primary, so why not just play for the primary anyway? Um, so like in a similar vein, and this is going to sound kind of weird, like I play Necrons pretty frequently, I would say, and that's kind of, it kind of weirdly plays in a similar way to Tyranids in that respect, like where I'm kind of more passive and just not trying to necessarily kill my opponent, but just take him off the objectives and win the game like via the primary. So uh, yeah, no, it totally makes sense to me. I think that's smart. What are so, sorry, go down. Rod and Rod for Tyranids is amazing because they have access to a unit called the Lictor, and the Lictor <laughs> is like the best rod handle you've ever seen in your life. Oh, oh he's he's the second best. Oh, okay, he got Gene Stealer Colts. <laughs> oh, yeah, Can sure, I, you're right, you're right. <laughs> gonna go ahead and disagree with uh, our, our chat boss here who said that that's the t shirt for meat curtains and just be like, Lictor is the best rod handler. It is now that that's the shirt right there. Um, 
but they are like lictors are great little units i i own literally 15 of them uh from an earlier edition from simpler times <laughs> um, from the before or, times in the long long ago the before well danny you remember my meme list which was like a thousand yeah. points of spores uh and it was just right. bizarre <laughs> and then one faq and i have like thousands of dollars of forge world like really like, unusable anymore um, uh. but, what are some units that you're taking, Tyler, that people are kind of maybe overlooking? Because we kind of were we're talking about how Tyranids aren't viewed as this five one faction or like the ability to get to those top tables. So when people are like looking at your list, what are they sort of overlooking uh, to be like, yeah, that's fine. Uh, overlooking is a is a bit of, of a question. The thing that I'm doing that I don't think nearly enough people are doing because they're scared of spending Forge World money is uh, Barb Pirate Duels. These guys are phenomenal uh, in High Fleet Jormungandr in particular. Um, we're talking about a, a toughness eight baddie walking around with a one plus armor save uh, and 18 wounds. People just don't know how to chew through that in the meta these days. Uh, and the output of these is phenomenal. And here's the thing. Like, this looks like a big scary monster that wants to kill things. It's not. Uh, it's a big scary monster that can actually stand on a, an objective. As I was saying earlier, like, Tyranids can't hold primary. This thing can hold primary. Um, so that's why I consider them basically mandatory before Octarius, and I still really like them afterwards. Yeah. So I guess moving on from that here, because again, Octarius came out. Uh, the, that book is kind of out in the wild now. And, and Tyranids are kind of, we had some reprint of some old rules uh, and then some new rules in there. And there's a lot of excitement around Tyranids now as kind of like a, a really contender, like top tier army. Kind of what, what's going on in that book that kind of makes that happen? Yeah, so there's there's a couple things. The first thing is that everyone got some new stuff. I mean, well, the first first thing is that the old rules got changed a little bit here and there. Uh, a couple of buffs, a couple of nerfs. Uh, I don't want to get into it. Um, the new stuff has two parts. There's a High Fleet Leviathan supplement, and there's the Synaptic Links, which are these new... Uh, there's so, like A lot of the 9th edition armies have this kind of thing, where certain models can buy points upgrades that hand out buffs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. so the Tyranid ones are insane. They're, they're <laughs> stupid. Cool. Uh, I, I I actively think that they should probably be nerfed. Um, I have two for 15 points for a unit, and you can have a total of three of these. You just hand out plus one to hit. Any unit in my army. This giant scary monster has plus one to hit for free. It's great. Um, well, it's 15 uh, points. Just, sorry, 15 points. Uh, I mean, so if you incredible. cheat, it's free. Like, uh, I yeah. believe him when he said it's free. <laughs> I'm not going to check Battle Scribe. But, or uh, the yeah, GW so that, app. Indeed. Um, so that's super cheap. Uh, the mouse after handing out reroll damage is super great. Those are those are all super exciting. But the real juice, I mean, the, the stuff that the, the Tyranid players are sort of salivating over is this High Fleet Leviathan supplement, which basically takes everything that Tyranids wanted other than durability uh, and just gives it to us in droves. Um, we just have to have a chapter master now. It's a warlord trait. And your unit of Hive Guard just full rerolls to hit. Incredible. Um, we have, uh, we have a one command point. Okay. So when enriched rounds came out, everyone was like, oh, wow, this is such a stupid stratagem. It makes this infantry unit kill way more than it possibly ever should. Tyranids have that now. Does. Oh, um, it still it's, is. Uh, it still does. <laughs> it doesn't do the same thing, but we basically have a one CP Tesla for devil gods. So this is a unit that has 90 strength, four shots that is now chapter mastered. So it's full rerolling to hit and every six to hit counts as three hits. And maybe it's plus one to hit as well, so it's hitting on threes instead of fours. Um, you string those things together, you average 120 hits. And then two CP, you shoot again. Um, that's hits, not shots. Uh, on a random troop unit that already has tons of utility and you were already taking. It's it's a stupid amount of firepower. Um, now, Tyler, jank as well. I hear you yeah. saying earlier that you don't want to play math armies. And that sounds like a <laughs> lot of numbers that you're throwing out right there. Indeed. I think that what is most exciting to me about this new book is that the downside of, of playing like a not very math oriented army is that every game you have to work for. Um, and I think it's like in the long run, it's, it's, it's advantageous, but like at SoCal, I, I played against, it's Brandon Grant. I played against free Buddhas. I also played against like random Lords of Skulls and very new players. Um, the difference in difficulty for me between those games is not very large because you have to scrap for every single point, and what your opponent is doing isn't really changing your plan all that much. Um, Did you tell Brandon Grant that so, it was like just oh, as easy to beat him as it was to beat like 
a person who just started playing with Lord of Skulls. <laughs> but not because of him, uh, but not because of things you have to do. Um, no, he, he was a fantastic opponent and an incredibly challenging uh, nut to crack. But like at the, at the base level, most people walking in with Admech, with, with Freebooters, with a lot of these more, more meta-oriented armies, know that they have like two or three rounds, especially with randomized pairings, of just seal clubbing. Just beat them off, move on, Nothing else mm-hmm. to think about. Table someone yeah, in two or three turns. I do have to um, say, I don't but... believe we anyone is beat off at these events. <laughs> <laughs> at least on purpose. It's it's sort of the expectation after having to play Admech or Freebooters. So uh, sure. maybe y'all are at the wrong events. But um, <laughs> but getting those, those sort of <laughs> relaxing rounds. Because like, like, well, by the... mm-hmm. you played Admech. It's the expectation. <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. what to tell you. <laughs> Anyway, moving on um, before I get moved on. <laughs> but yeah, so so it's it's very tiring. So now with a lot of these serious increases in DPS, serious increases in uh, in output, uh, now we just will table some people. Um, but we haven't lost any of the jank, so I still get to do all of my favorite parts of the army. And then also my opponent just happens to have less stuff to play with. It's kind of a win win situation where I haven't I don't have to adapt to learn anything new. I mean, I do. There's new stuff, but like that seems very fundamentally, the army still works the same in way. Um, so I'm, yeah, not a ton of adaptation actually. Uh, it was, yeah, it's very, it's very, it's very, very, unusual very un- yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it's very untenant of you to be like, great, I don't have to adapt anymore. We're just gonna stay on the same level. <laughs> <I'm> the <perfect laughs> um, so, kind of moving from your SoCal list uh, for what you had, and now you have this Arteria supplement, which obviously you're going to mm-hmm. be using things from. What kind of changes are you making to kind of maximize what you're given? Yeah, for sure. So, like the, I assume that most Tyranid players, is the moment they read the Arteria's rules, they took their like Kraken, Kronos, multi patrols, or, or Jormungandr, if you're a snowflake like me, and just said, "Oh, smush them to a single Leviathan battalion, and then just you know cut." 45 points to add some of these synaptic links and just sort of go from there. And that totally works. Um, There's versions of my list that do that and they're very exciting. But I think there's a couple of things that need to get worked in. I think a Maliceptor is the phenomenal take now. I used to love him already, but he got moved out. So he's back. He's handing out reroll damage to Hive Guard, which just takes them up another notch. And he's got that react, not reactive, it's start of your opponent's turn, but he's got that defensive minus one to incoming strength aura strat. Mm-hmm. Which makes the hero duel significantly more defensive, makes the hive guard more defensive against rocket trucks and um DACA jets. Like it's it's a really nice thing um to have access to. So he's working his way in. Oh, oh, oh my favorites, my favorites, they're back. They're okay. Back. Oh. Oh, my boy is for my those boys. just listening to the podcast, he excitedly rolled backwards on his chair and grabbed <laughs> Holy... what appears to be some kind of flying <laughs> ripper swarm i don't know i assume these are the uh, legendary sky slashers so, yeah, Indeed, the legendary, these are... those were just experimental thought processes like a radio <laughs> album before this uh but yeah sky slashers are back in a big way we have one cp uh in your command phase obsec for a full battle round so suddenly uh, a tiny mm. little unit that moves 12 and has fly and cost 45 points is insane because again tyranids double move for a cp Suddenly I have three OPSEC models moving minimum uh, 26 inches, maximum at a 36, um, just zipping across the board, stealing primary. Um, these are the, the biggest pain in the tail models you will ever construct. But um, oh, I built, worth I it, built I like 45 spirit them. host for Mage of Sigmar, and I'm going to contend that those are the most pain in the butt model to ever construct. Yeah. So, John, each of these three rippers is seven components. Oh, fair. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> and they don't come with mounting pegs or holes. You drill them and you find some wire somewhere. Uh, sounds like a personal problem. Yep, uh, got to drill them out. Right Got it. Got it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, but yeah, so they'll be coming back. So as we kind of noted earlier, uh, there is a problem right now with some list archetypes for different armies. So you have like the, the free Buddha truck plane spam. We have some ad builds. 
Um, we have Drukari still kind of with that super high win rate on the horizon. Um, what are you doing to kind of counteract seeing those? Because again, you, you, you're saying like you're going to advance kind of as a, a higher caliber player, like you're, you rank second right now for forces of the hive mind. You, you don't expect kind of like the hardest matches to start up, but eventually you're going to be getting into these sort of builds. Um, and especially mm-hmm. as they become more popular, what are your plans for kind of taking on those builds? Yeah. So, um, Dark Eldar aren't a problem. They never have been. Uh, you can watch, if you're not sure how Hivemind beats Dark Eldar, uh, go back. I think it's on the Canhammer stream. You can watch me uh, do unsavory things to Anthony Vanilla on uh, at Charity Hammer. You also um, played him a Warhammer. We, <laughs> indeed. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, we just have the mobility to get around them and the right tools to pull uh, light infantry and the right indirect to deal with raiders. It's just, it's very fine. Yeah. But the big three, then, that we have to worry about, Grey Knights, uh, Admech, and um, Free Buddhas. Uh, Grey Knights are super interesting. I haven't played that a ton. I did get to play it at SoCal, and it was a super tight, interesting game. Um, but generally, I'm not crazy concerned about Marines or other things with two up, four ups that are only T6. Like, we can, we can work through that. We can play around it. Their angle cutting is interesting, but there's not much tech for it. Um... Admech are a problem. I don't know how to beat Admech right now. Uh, I didn't play them at SoCal. Uh, if you have three Stratoraptors in your list, like, cool. Eh. Um, I, I'm sort of just waiting on nerfs in that. The free Buddhas, though, that's something you've got to actually build for. Um, and that's sort of where the Gene Stealer cult component comes in. I played against free Buddhas round five and went second. And the only reason I was able to hang in that game at all, um, which I did eventually win, was with all of the blips from Gene Stealer cults because the free Buddha's thing is they have to get behind your lines and then see you backwards with their planes and then blast you off of objectives and stuff. And with blips, you can't physically move within nine inches of them. So if you put enough of them on the table, the planes can't land anywhere. Uh, they can't even come within nine of your DZ and suddenly they can't even score engage. Another reason not to take engage. Um, but, uh, but so that really holds them off. Uh, also, we were playing uh, on battle line, so I was able to stay out of scrap jet range. Um, yes, yeah, so the blips are really helpful there. Uh, the duels are really helpful there because I'm, I'm an army of strength they two damage. But the big problem they run into is that they don't have obsec. They don't have bodies. So if you can sneak around and, and deny primary on them, it's great. And then also the Malanthrope is back in the list, which is wonderful because sure. that list really struggles through a minus one. Uh, the Blood Axe version struggles even, even more. But uh, if you can keep the free Buddhas from popping their plus one, their plus two, their plus three, the the longer you can prolong the wait until you get there, the better chance you have at having something left on the table to play the mission with. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's really great advice. Like uh, the blip thing is pretty ingenious. I've definitely encountered that in not this edition, but last edition uh, when planes mm-hmm. were a little bit more popular. Uh, that they were that they were successfully able to like keep like my Necron flyers, for instance, like kind of really at bay, um, which was which was hard to deal with. Like the hive guard were almost impossible to get to. Yeah. So yeah, that and is you the need biggest them thing. To win that... right, like the yeah. hive. Guard oh, they're just necessary. Because yeah. if yeah, um, the hive guard still get hurt by the ruckus real bad, but with the malanthrope now it's and the malaceptor it's less so. Yeah. But that was the biggest thing I missed about 8th edition was back when I could crash planes. That was my favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. I had an extra flyer base that I would bring around with me that just said planes are dumb written on it. <laughs> and I would use that as a measuring tool to see how quickly I could knock you off a table. The best one that that happened on uh, was the Razorwing Jet Fighters because they couldn't even do the Eldar fish thing, you know, mm-hmm. where they kind of flat back and forth. Uh, and I once was able to crash a Razorwing Jet Fighter with six brood brothers and a sanctus nice cleverly placed uh and he he just he spent like a good 10 minutes on his clock dumbfounded that this had been measured properly but it oh, please bring it back if you're listening to gw let me crash planes <laughs> let me crash them uh, <laughs> awesome man yeah that's a good point point. and like i can see how the hive guard would still get hurt by the ruckus like even though they're normally ap minus two and you could ignore that with the uh mm-hmm. oh what is that that ignore ap minus one it enhanced the, resistance the, um, yeah. yeah the adaptation or whatever yeah mm-hmm. um and but then on the water and they're minus three right so like yeah and the turn after right right so um, that's an issue 
But yeah, so you slap minus one to hit on them, you slap minus one incoming strength on them, and then the Ruckas are fives and fives. If you're on player optimized, if you're on the pot, as they say around here, yeah. um, you can get them in a forest as well, and suddenly they're minus two. Remember that Ruckas aren't ballistic skill four, they're ballistic skill five with plus one to hit native. So if you right. put them to minus two, they are hitting on sixes. And now, yeah. hitting on sixes, wounding on fives, now they're not doing anything, even if they are AP3. Yeah, that's especially brutal. Nice. Yeah, like, that's smart. Danny, you've, you've tried tiered it's like a little bit from ninth edition, right? Like when you're kind of cycling through the armies. Like, uh, what was your I, take of them as a faction in this edition? Well, so uh, yeah, I play, So first of all, I played against Tyler actually uh, like a fair amount on uh, Tabletop <laughs> okay. Simulator. Um, so <laughs> I haven't actually played Tyranids myself yet in ninth edition, but I did play them at the very end of eighth edition. Like, uh, remember we had that, uh, that GT, the Iron Man one that we had at the end of eighth. Um, like right before that was, that was the best. I don't, I don't think you've kind of told the story about this one before. Um, or maybe you have uh, like the story and then Tyler, you'll probably love this too. I don't, have you heard this story from, from Danny here about why he ran that certain list? (laughs) Please. Oh yeah. Uh, so my friend, Eric, uh, Eric records told me that he couldn't, uh, that I couldn't play Tyranids as well as him. And I told him that he was full of so uh <laughs> so we both played exactly the same list that we took to this iron man event well the list that we took was all like turvagons and gaunts uh so i played like 120 termagants and three turvagons <laughs> with the maliceptor and the hive guard and all that stuff uh at the very end of eighth and uh yeah let me tell you five rounds in a row playing that many models like all in a <laughs> row is uh is physically challenging yeah, it's um, real. Like, so yeah, it was an event I ran uh, for for that kind of GT in a day, and we're like giving people tokens when they quit early, and like mm-hmm. it was fine for me because I dropped out early. I was never in winning contention, but like even at the last round, you're like, I have to use my brain so much. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. It was very difficult. And then like, so I made it to f- top table. So I was in T whip for that with that list, and yeah, that's that uh, tiles in winning position. Yeah. <laughs> uh but I ended up losing the last round. It was it was it was super fun though. Uh but extremely exhausting. So that kind of brings me to my next question. So do you find it physically exhausting to play this army like at a large event? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. It's not as bad as Gaunt Carpet was back when that was the style at the time. Um but it still is physically and like intellectually draining. Mm-hmm. Um I was reviewing the tape of my of my round six game, my my one loss to Scott, and like there's like three or four just stupid mistakes that happen in there um, yeah. that I simply like don't remember even thinking about because it it it, it was round six, um, and uh, and there's just too much to move and too many options. It's the downside of having an army that largely starts a lot of its fun tools in Strat Reserver and Deep Strike. Hey, so uh, let's let's just, make a comment about that though, Tyler. Like that's mm-hmm. important to, to note. Tyler didn't go five and one; like he lost the first round and then won five more times. Tyler won five times in a row and then lost the last round. So, like that is an incredible feat because every single one of his opponents is getting more and more difficult um, based on win path. And so, I, like that's super commendable. Like I think you did such an amazing job at that event. Much appreciated. Thank you. So. Yeah. Was was there a part of you that was thankful you lost the six rounds so you didn't have to do the third day with three more days? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I thought there would be, but then I showed up, up day three and asked if I could play with some Octarius rules, and the TO said fine, so I jumped in an RTT. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I played nine games anyway. But you I will say... Animal. <laughs> I had so much fun game set seven, you know, the first two games there, TT, but then round three, I was up against Terminus Est and it was a really interesting, very thought provoking game. And my body is just not having it. Uh, and so, they're like, Hey, we got to move. We got to move. So man. this a lot Terminus going Est on. list, let's, let's talk about what that comprised of. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we're having a really, in- a really challenging intellectual game. And, and uh, suddenly they're like, Hey, you guys got to wrap it up. And I look forward and I'm like, all right, so win the game, I have to do this, that, and that. And you know, we're talking stuff out and I'm like, okay, well, that sounds challenging. Good game. You win. And I went and lied down for a while. <laughs> so maybe, maybe day three in the, in the main event would not have been the right call. Oof. <laughs> Oof. 
That's terrible. But again, yes. Yeah, so this terminus S list that we made the third round of an RT. You know, um, mainly, so you you played some games using these new Arterius rules, kind of. And I'm assuming on that Sunday for the RTT, you were playing the same list uh, or a very similar list to what you were running Saturday, um, unless yeah. you travel with your entire army. Like, what no. differences in, in power level were you seeing just over that one day? Oh, it's it's dumb. The uh, like. It really, it, it honestly, I'm kind of asking for nerfs already um, because the firepower that comes out of these new rules is is, is, is stupid. It just is. Um, you shouldn't be able to do that much damage at that little resource input and particularly from indirect. Uh, I'm only playing one unit of Hive Guard. I don't intend to play two units of Hive Guard. I have two units of Hive Guard, so maybe. But um, I think that people are going to be really, really upset. I think that a lot of people are going to say that, a, that Tyranids are part of the problem as much as I would love to be part of the solution, because two units of fully functioning hive guard, one of which is double tapping every turn, with these new buffs are just gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt really bad. Yeah. And it's gonna a lot of people are gonna go four and one and table people and it's it's gonna be really upsetting. So I, I would definitely be watching out for them. If uh, if you're not thinking about how to deal with mass strength eight multi damage indirect, I mean I don't know what your plan was, <laughs> but uh be red make one. Um, cause that's, that's going to be out there as someone who's not even figured out a plan for like, uh, how to score primary Danny, um, uh, how, how do you deal with that? Cause again, you've kind of looked over the Octarius rules and you've seen kind of what's coming. What is your defense against this kind of new Uber buff type card? Well, you should at least, so you need to have a unit. First of all, like the hive guard are really good and they are very frightening. Uh, I'm actually more worried about the gods. Like yeah, I think that correct. I think yeah I think that they do like surprisingly more damage than you like it, it's a it's it's way more damage than you would add, than you would expect them to do because like 240 hits like translates into basically like against anything that's not toughness eight is what is what uh, you're looking at 80 wounds and that'll kill basically anything in the game like anything mm -hmm. more than that because they reroll once. Oh sure, or yeah, or yeah. they could potentially even be real in ones and twos, because um, that's an adaptation that you could get too, right? So a chest block is what you're Danny. saying Don't is the first Turvagon. thing you need to take. <laughs> no, no, I will take the Turvagon. That's my jam. Don't do it, Danny. Don't Baby do mom it, Danny. is my jam. <laughs> I'm into it. I, I I don't even think it's bad. Like, <laughs> like okay, Tyler, it is yeah. toughness eight with minus one to yep. wound. Yep. I, I, we're on turbicons. We're going yeah. full turbicon here. What, what, like, what does it do? Say minus one to wound, and then minus one okay. strength from the ranged attacks that are going against it, potentially. If you're going to spend two CP a turn on that, for sure. Yeah. It's it's cute. What yeah. does it do? Nothing. <laughs> it sits there and gives me reroll ones, ones and twos to wound. <laughs> like, so what? It's like, like I, I would target a doom. It's amazing. Like, I could put that on my hive guard if I'm shooting at raiders, which is potentially you, better you, than... You can only have i the, against raiders no i'd much rather the the reroll damage and the sixes or extra ap is really saucy yeah that's uh, fair but you're you're, you're closing well, yourself off raiders, to a lot of options like you know for sure of course yeah yeah but you're closing yourself up but like raiders weren't the problem initially the thing that the turbagon yeah. isn't doing for me is it's not helping in hard matchups and so you're already taking a malice scepter because you want that minus one strength so now ostensibly you want the real damage so maybe you've got one squad of hive guard that's not hitting very well but it reels ones and twos to wound and you've got one squad that hits really that does the extra damage and then you've got a plus one to hit i guess but you're spending so many points at that point at your castle because here's the thing that turbagon seems really cool it's 200 and what 45 points 230 base plus 15 for the adaptation Get, get it away from me. I don't want to spend a quarter of my points on a model that doesn't do anything. <laughs> I, I, I thought say. it was only 190 points. No, he's, he's, he's 190. I think he's like 190. And then you have to take his weapons. And then and 15 more for the for the adaptation. All right. Yeah, I'll have to look. Was like my my favorite it. part about this Turvagon rant, I was looking at my screen here and seeing Val slowly read the comment I just read. <laughs> and then seeing Danny a minute later read the comment I just read, uh, which was the Turvagon's greatest value is providing a visual metaphor for testicular cancer. <laughs> so I think that person is solely Team Tyler uh, when it comes to, to Turvagons. 
<laughs> for sure. But I mean, like as a layman here, doesn't it provide some value just kind of sitting on an objective? I mean, yeah. You, you just you just told me the value of of a uh, of a uh, Hyrodule sitting on an objective. Here's another contender that's yeah, so- arguably dur- more durable. Man, he's um, he's so I frozen. I he's frozen. so shocked at the. Okay. How, how <laughs> dare you ask him um, that question to the point? So yeah, free. for sure. In inarguably more durable, both tough to say. I mean, it has fewer wounds and it has a worse save, but like. I'd rather have. I'd wound, rather have some, nice. I'd rather have fourteen wounds so that I can hide behind terrain. I'm aware of that, <laughs> but not if you're going to stand on an objective well, in the open. Maybe, Wasn't that the whole point to stand out in the open? Who knows? What? Whatever. Whatever the well, if you're not being shot at, then it doesn't matter whether you're Great. durable or not. But beyond that, we're talking about like 40 more points to have 12 8 2 2 shots and four 10 3 d 3 plus three close combat attacks. <laughs> like, if that's not worth 40 points to give up the option to take a relic, like, and also that relic is costing you command points. I don't want that hey, relic. Get out of hey, here. You know what? 40 points gives me another sky slasher swarm. So, I mean, like. <laughs> You make I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> and to to be fair, if you're firing with all your turbogons, who cares what the strength and damage of this dude's guns are? That unit's dead anyway. <laughs> Just saying. And um, I'm rolling. <laughs> anyway, no, no, it's uh, I hear I hear your point, and it's yeah. and it's valid. It's valid. No, I'd, I'd love I'd love to see it. I'd love to be wrong. Don't get me don't get me wrong. It's a really cool idea. I would love to be able to put an unkillable turbogon on the table and not feel like a, a sinking feeling in my stomach that I've just like taken two hundred and thirty points and just sort of yeet. Um, <laughs> right but, into the trash. Uh, if, yeah, if you can if you can make it work, I'll I'll give it a go. Absolutely. All right. Happy Sounds to be good. wrong. I Sounds just want to cool. see kind of like Tyler start the game, put his turbogon on an objective, and be like, okay, look. I'm just going to score myself 15 points for primary from this guy and just put him in the trash can. We're going to call it good. Okay? You're going to like, like it. <laughs> like, ultimate mass hammer. Um, mm-hmm. Tyranids have so many units. Uh, like a ton. And they have huge Forge World support when uh, the, the Forge World supplement came out. It was Jurassic Park in space. Uh, what are some of, you would say, the very worst Tyranids units that are out there? Oh, yeah. Please don't say Turbogon. We spent just 10 minutes talking about (laughs) Turbogon. Okay, I'll put that one to the side. It's really Um, important to me that you don't trash the Turbogon anymore. (laughs) (laughs) The the problem with bugs right now, and the thing that I think is going to upset a lot of people who are hardcore Tyranid players, is that there is not a single thing in this book that makes the bad units good. Um, Like, the Maliceptor maybe works its way back in. But basically every unit that I am taking now, I was already at least very seriously considering taking. The terrible units are still terrible. Um, the horror specs, for example. Uh, I may in post put up a screenshot in here of a, a text conversation with John Lennon where I have to explain to him that a horror specs is a weapon skill for close combat dedicated monster with four attacks. Well, oh. when you put it like that, that just sounds awful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, also terrible. Uh, the Trigon is still toughness six Aww. with a four, uh, three plus four plus save. One of those, but it's, it's toughness a six. Plus. Yeah, it's a three plus. Okay, but he's T six, which is oh, breathtakingly awful. Um, I literally just watched Dune last night, and you're trashing the, the sandworms that come up through the thing. That's not cool. <laughs> the Trigon Prime is one of the biggest disappointments in the new book because his. His synaptic link is fall back, shoot, and charge. Yeah. No penalties. Wild strong. Tyranids have been asking to let Hiveguard fall back and shoot forever, and I will never take it. Uh, <laughs> because a Trigon Prime is such a useless piece of garbage that uh, I couldn't imagine taking one. <laughs> um, so he's awful. And then the Flyers. The Flyers are possibly oh, some of the worst man. examples. Yeah, okay, fair. Which is that a Harpy, I believe, is 15 points less than a Stratoraptor? Or maybe then a few salav. But for that price, um, your your toughness six with a four plus save and ten or twelve wounds, uh, and you just sort of fly around and get attacked. And you're not even a plane. Like you're an aircraft slot or a a flyer, yeah. you're a flyer, but you're not aircraft. You just move thirty inches and still get charged with your T six four up save, twelve wounds. And do only and three of those. It's perfect it's for you to degrade and hit on sixes. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, we degrade real hard. Um, so those are, those are probably, uh, those three are probably the worst, um, honorable mention to the toxic crane who is honestly not terrible. I would Ooh. seriously consider him currently. He's got that two up strat to keep things from falling back. He does decent output with murderous size. You could really rack up the damage. And then you look at that physical model, which is on, you know, a standard monster oval base, but it's giant tentacle arms extend another two oval bases worth of space. Yep. So yep. at its, so it, it can't fit through anything that's less than eight and a half inches wide. So it, it Man, can't go, go anywhere. Yeah, there is. <laughs> I'm too mature to make that joke right now, but, but there's a joke there about it. <laughs> but, um, so he's, he's completely unplayable just from a physical modeling perspective, regardless of what his rules are. Which is just deeply depressing because he looks so cool. But he does. No, you just you can't. No, for sure. So we're going to wrap this up here with a question. I'm going to ask both of you guys for for your your vast Tyranid histories. How do you beat Tyranids? Like so so Tyler. So like someone is playing against you. Like what do they have to do to beat your army list? Because again, it's maybe not something they're used to say, seeing on the table quite as much as other things here. Danny, you look very happy about your answer. I'm quite curious to hear yeah, it. Yeah, it's a Tomb Blades, everyone. Tomb Blades is the answer. <laughs> um, he's not wrong. Yeah, that's why Black Templars are the worst, is because they can't take Tomb Blades. Uh, it's the obvious thing here. <laughs> True. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Tyrion Necron matchup is actually like somewhat problematic because the thing that Tyranids can't do, or well, couldn't do, is kill stuff particularly effectively. So if I wanted to take your primary, which I had to do because I can't score primary, so I can't possibly have you scoring primary or I'm going to lose. Right, so the plan is I'm going to spend one command point and I'm going to metabolic overdrive and my hormigons with adrenal glands are going to go a minimum of 20 inches and put obsec on your objective maximum of uh, 30 inches. It's glorious. Um, but if you just have like a really durable obsec unit that sits there and outnumbers me and says there's nothing I can do about it, like... I'm kind of in trouble. Uh, yeah. That really, that really, really grinds my gears. Obviously, now we have a little bit more killing power to deal with that, but that's that's problem number one. If you're actually good at holding primary, not a ton I can do. Um, problem number two is if you can outscore me without me doing anything, without interacting with me. Um, so, like dark angels are a big problem uh, because as if you're gonna get at, at your your free forty five secondaries and you're just gonna match me on primary, like. <laughs> It, I got to dig myself out of a hole. Uh, and then lastly, the thing that you can do, because those are sort of build oriented things. The thing you can always try to do um, is, uh, is play, at least try to play the game of tag the hive guard. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, the big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have a lot of dedicated close combat, and even if you do combat is after shooting. So if you can get in combat with hive guard, they're like a very classic, like eighth edition, just tag the shooting unit sort of bit problem to solve. So if you can make that happen, that works out pretty well in uh in your favor those are sort of my my three biggest tips if you want to if you want to beat the bugs got it so danny did so, you get that yeah so what tyler said is play all of the armies that i currently play and uh <laughs> so which are which are admech dark angels and necrons uh and i'll be fine so that's good to know yeah <laughs> i i heard from that score points score secondaries <laughs> <laughs> win the game which i found a lot less helpful for you danny because i don't own dark angels or ad mech or um though hopefully with you being so sick of ad mech you'll just mail that right on up so it I, sucks, it sucks <laughs> to suck john bro, it really does like no one truly understands no one wants to talk to the losers um quick question from chat here before we kind of wrap this up here uh someone's saying can trigon prime do anything if it has xenogenic acid if it has xenogenic acid, is that the toxin sacs re replacement relic? What? That's yeah, that right. of of all the things that I seems like chat, the chat real hardcore here and trying to redeem the trigon prime. Yeah, like, um, there's a lot of doom so you going could, on in the air. Yeah, you could if so that 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 gives you um, unmodified wound rolls of a five plus. Do a mortal wound in addition. I see what you're trying to do because it's a model with seven attacks. 
and one CP reroll, full rerolls to wound. That's really nice. The problem with the Trigon is not its damage output. If you just slap murderous size on it and can deliver it reasonably well, like you'll you'll mess something up in combat for like sure. It slaps, right? Like yeah, I mean, absolutely. Does, yeah. If you get if you can get the if you can start it on the table so it doesn't deep strike so it can benefit from a synaptic link and you can put the malice scepter buff on it and you have a d6 you have seven attacks at d6 damage re rolling damage like that's that's gonna hurt some stuff um, the unfortunate reality is that that doesn't like do anything useful um, you have very effectively killed a model and you are immediately removed from the game uh, I just don't rate it as a way to play I've never really rated Demacarons either people are still playing them. Just from a, I mean, a utility perspective, it does the one thing. It goes on a one-way trip. And the Trigon Prime just takes everything that Adima Karen was doing, does it a little bit worse, um, and is even more one-dimensional somehow because it That's doesn't true. even have a semblance of durability. <laughs> yeah. Stop. As our producer is telling us, stop, he's already dead. Uh, and if our editor could put that uh, Ralph Wiggum meme in there afterwards, that would be great. <laughs> Danny, um, as we're wrapping this up, is there anything else you want to talk to Tyler about here? Uh, anything else going on there? No, I'm done with him. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, guys, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for tuning in. Uh, I'm watching us on Twitch. Not on YouTube. Those guys suck. Uh, unless you're watching that at a version, which, you know, thanks so much. That, that's super mm -hmm. appreciative of you. Um, we are going to be back, Danny and I, next Monday. Uh, around, you know, some time-ish. Uh, you, you know how we go here. Uh, we are going to be talking to War Games Live uh, as a gentleman who is traveling oh, yeah. the country, uh, streaming just tournaments everywhere. He was at uh, Stutter Snotling. He's over on the East Coast, I think, when we're talking to him. Uh, so super, super excited to talk to him about what he's doing with the hobby. Um, and then I, I don't have an outro anymore. I used to say, see you next Tuesday. Uh, and see you next Monday. It just doesn't have the same kind of ring to it. Um, but that's okay. I guess we'll just... We're, 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 we're famed. I was going to say we're, we're famed hey. for kind of just repeating dead jokes. Uh, well, first sorry, of all, Danny, you were gonna say. I would really like to thank Tyler for coming on and, and talking with us tonight. Um, thank you so much, man. It's uh, for not just this, but everything that you do for the podcast. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank so, you. I'm gonna say my funny. favorite my favorite thing he's done is there was one week where the stream melted down and all of the assets disappeared and he just wrote the word couch. And put that on the screen where the couch should be. Um, that was all it was Tyler. Excellent. It was excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and as as our producer told us, our new uh, go out catchphrase. Thank you so much, Tyler. It's, uh, it's meat curtains for us now. Uh, as we leave this episode, um, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you next time.